Hi everybody. Today we're going to talk about human variability and variation. Why are we the way that we are? Why do different groups of people from around the world, uh, why are we different colors and shapes and sizes? And what, if anything, these differences mean? Well, as you probably already know, humans, as with every organism, are really based on adaptations to our environment. Most of these changes that we see around the world with different populations of people are based on where those peoples are from. Most people probably already know that. But today we're going to get into a little bit about what these ch changes and variations mean in modern human populations, why those variations exist in the first place, and what caused these, if anything, what these variations are doing for us and how those adaptations were kind of developed. The other thing that we might be able to do is break down some of the presuppositions that a lot of you have. Maybe break down some of the um, kind of stereotypical ideas that you may have or just things that we've been told that may not be 100% accurate. Um, sometimes we're told sort of boiled down or, or basic stuff, and it's usually a lot more complex than what you may think. So with those ideas, let's get started. Okay, as you probably already know, because I've said it several times, we are all from originally Africa. All humans, in fact all hominins on this planet, originated in the huge, which is not really properly diagrammed in this picture, uh, continent of Africa. Africa is a big place. It's got a very diverse population on it. It's had a very diverse um, climate throughout the entire place. There are deserts. There are rainforests. There are everything in between. So we're going to talk a little bit about skin color variation. This is the first thing that most people associate with differences of population around the world. Why is it all based on skin tone? Well, it's a very obvious thing, and there are a lot of, as we know, preconceived notions about skin color variation, some of which are right, some of which are wrong, and some of which you may have not ever been exposed to or really understood. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. As you can see with this map, we have basically a map showing of the Earth showing the variations in skin tones around the world. You can probably see, as you as if you probably haven't already come up with this, the darker skin tones are concentrated in the equatorial regions. In other words, near the equator. Why is that? Well, you can see the shape of the Earth. It's exaggerated in this picture, but shape of the Earth is an ellipse. It is almost round. It's pretty close to round, but it does bulge around the equator. But there's another thing. There's another sphere that is the Earth. I'm sorry, that is the Sun. The Sun emits sunlight. The UV rays which are hitting, if you imagine these coming off a sphere over from this side, and the rays coming in straight, they're going to hit less atmosphere at these angles than they will as the sun rays kind of skim across and get to these higher latitudes. We're going to talk about why that's important later on, but just for now, you probably already know that direct sunlight is what causes these darker skin tone variations that we see toward the equatorial regions in the world. Okay. Easy question. What does darker skin do for people in those areas? Well, we probably already know that it protects from UV rays, right? Sunlight, ultraviolet radiation. Dark skin is much more capable of dealing with and fending off the ultraviolet rays. So why is it that darker skin appears in those areas? Well, the answer is fairly obvious. If you don't have darker skin in the equatorial region, you are exposed to more sunlight and this can be very dangerous. Now here's the trick question. Why is it dangerous? 
Why is too much ultraviolet exposure dangerous historically for people with lighter skin? Or all skin types, really. But the lighter skin is much more affected by the ultraviolet radiation. I'm going to guess that your first reaction right now is cancer, skin cancer, right? Well, it's actually not skin cancer. It's something more simple and more common than that. The reason being, skin cancer is a relatively new uh, malady. It's a problem big time. And if you do have lighter skin, it is something that you probably may have to deal with if you have a lot of unprotected sun exposure throughout your life. But we actually, skin cancer is a relatively new uh, sickness or, or malady or disease because we live longer nowadays. But besides that, something else would actually kill you much earlier than the skin cancer would have. Historically, the thing that kills people with lighter skin getting high amounts of ultraviolet radiation is something most people with light skin, and in fact most people with dark skin, have dealt with at least once or twice in their life. Sunburn. Now the big thing is nowadays we think of sunburns as either something kind of silly or yeah it's going to be skin damage. You can tell that these people are going to have skin damage, some of which already do freckles and some of these age spots are in fact ultraviolet skin damage. It's permanent. But how would a sunburn be deadly in the past? Well, first of all it can lead to dehydration. There's an old adage that it's, it's called the survival rule of threes. That is, you can live about three weeks. This is a, a relatively healthy, relatively normally fit person. Can live for about three weeks without food. For about three days without water. And about three minutes without oxygen. Well, this one's the one in the middle. That three days without water can be reduced dramatically with somebody who has a sunburn. It can be less than a day in some of these extreme sunburn situations. Now actually, just for clarity, I, mostly because I'm being nice, decided not to show you how bad sunburns can actually get, but you probably already know they can have weeping pus sores, uh, which are raised blisters raised by the sun. These are water and electrolytes being drained from your body in an attempt to help the skin heal. The skin's an organ after all, and you cannot live without it. Furthermore, sunburns are extremely painful. Um, if you were a hunter-gatherer, and you had an extreme sunburn, and you had to go back out into the sun to go out and gather food, or even hunt, which is unlikely, what are the chances you'd do it if you have an extreme sunburn? Well. Two things. One, it'll probably kill you if you went back out anyway. And so, really, it's easier to go without food and anything else, really, except for water, without going outside <laughs> if you have an extreme sunburn. And secondly, those pussy sores that we talked about before, the raised uh, um, areas that are uh, blistered, can become infected and you can die from a bacterial infection. You can go septic and die if these things are untreated. Now, nowadays we have a lot of ways to treat it. And in fact, you don't even have to go out. You can just order in and stay home and, you know, lay in a bathtub full of aloe if you want to, which is great for short term survival. Thus, nowadays we focus more on things like skin cancer. But back in the day, which, by the way, is the majority of the time that our, that, that our uh, species was on the Earth. Remember, we've been around for about 300,000 years. We've only had kind of uh, sedentary lifestyles and a place to go regularly in the past 10,000 years or so. And in fact, most places even less time than that. So what we're looking at is a very relatively new thing. And of course, Uber Eats is much newer. So that's a first misconception that a lot of people have. That leads us to another issue that is very hard to fully understand. 
Why then, if darker skin helps us in the equatorial region, and indeed, if we were all from that region originally, in fact, all populations of humans, which we'll explain uh, in a little while, but full, uh, for right now, just know this, all humans, and in fact, all of our predecessors, came from Africa, as I mentioned before. So we started out ostensibly with this darker skin. Why then, toward the higher latitudes, that is, north and south, does, do skin tones become lighter? That's a weird one. A lot of people don't know the answer to this. Most people are probably thinking, well, it's just from the absence of direct sunlight. Because again, remember, we talked about the sun being a sphere and those light beams coming in at different angles. And as we get into the higher latitudes on the planet, we can see that these angles are much more oblique, meaning it's going through a lot more kind of a cross section of the atmosphere before it gets there. Therefore, a lot less UV light rays make it to the surface of the Earth. So, why would the skin tone become lighter? Well, most of you would say, well, hey, we're not reacting. The melanocytes, which are in our skin, those are those reactive cells that react and, and produce melanin in the skin, which causes that darkening of the skin. If they're not getting the UV sunlight, then they don't have to produce the melanin. Therefore, the skin tones are lighter. Well, actually, it's more than just that. Melanocytes and what they produce, the melanin that they produce, is actually a defense mechanism against the direct ultraviolet rays. So, yes, from those latitudes, you won't need as much. But why then? Aren't there dark people living up there that just don't really use the melanocytes? What's going on? Is there an advantage similar to the advantage against ultraviolet rays in the equatorial region? Is there an advantage up at those higher latitudes to have lighter toned skin? Big question. Some of you may be answering yes. Some of you may know the answer to what that is, actually. The answer is, in fact, yes, there is an advantage to having lighter skin in those higher latitudes, both north and south. What is it, and what is it reacting to? Well, skin tone is determining on how much ultraviolet rays that we interact with. But do we need ultraviolet radiation? The answer to that is also yes. Two of the things that are dependent on that ultraviolet radiation. The first one, which may or may not surprise you, depends on how much you know about this particular subject. The first one is vitamin D, as in dog. Vitamin D. Vitamin D allows our bodies to do other things. The biggest one that we're going to be dealing with here anyway, because we're dealing with bones, is calcium. Do you need calcium in your bones? The answer is yes. Why? Well, calcium acts, calcium is a mineral, it's actually a mineral salt, and it acts as a stiffening agent to the bone. It makes bone more rigid, less flexible, less bendy. The only way to get vitamin D is through that ultraviolet radiation. Our bodies, we can eat vitamin D, but it actually doesn't become activated in a way. In other words, it's not actively pulling in that calcium out of the food that we eat and allowing it to enter into our bones without that vitamin D. It's kind of like a gateway, sort of like a, a domino effect. So if someone is not getting enough vitamin D, they will not produce or receive enough calcium in their bones. Therefore, their bones will not be rigid enough. What does that look like? This is a pair of children who were born 
in Hungary around about the turn of the century, that is, the 1900s. Nothing looks all that off about these kids until you look at their legs. Most people will notice the little girl first. They'll notice that extreme bowing to her lower legs. Do you see how bowed out her lower legs are? The little boy also has bowed legs, although they're obscured by his pants, but you can see they're, they're swishing over to one side. This is exactly what's happening with kids that aren't getting enough ultraviolet radiation. Therefore, they're not getting enough vitamin D, which is not allowing them to have enough calcium in their bones. Their bones become softened. This is an old term that you may have heard. You may have heard your mother say, don't sit in that rickety chair, or I don't want to cross that rickety bridge. This is a disease called rickets, R-I-C-K-E-T-T -T apostrophe S. Rickets disease, which is rampant among children especially. It tends to show up more in children because their bones are still growing and forming. This causes a tax on the amount of vitamins and minerals and nutrients that they have in their bodies anyway. So if you reduce that by poverty and add to that by putting them into a situation in which is not healthy. Now something else was going on in the world around that time. It was called the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was the shift. People were moving into cities and they were working, instead of on the farm, in factories. Now, did this factory work leave out children? No. Most kids were actually working quite often in factories. In fact, the term grease monkey, which you may now associate with things like uh, mechanics, people who work on cars, is actually a term that was most often incorporated, used toward these little boys, about the age of this child here. What they would do is they would literally crawl throughout the mechanisms of these big industrial machines, weaving machines and otherwise, and go in and clean them or grease them. Thus the term grease monkey. They climbed around in there because they were small enough to get inside all the machinery. Did they turn off the machines while they were doing this? Hell no. They kept working. So there these little kids are in these extremely dangerous situations. Furthermore, were they working an eight-hour day and then coming home after a long day's work? Nope. They would work usually from sunup to sundown, which meant inside a factory, you think they're getting a lot of light? You think they're getting a lot of exposure to sunlight on their days off, which they don't have? No. So what's happening? They're not getting enough sunlight. Therefore, they're not producing enough vitamin D. Therefore, they're not absorbing the calcium into their bones. Therefore, their bones are not becoming rigid. It's that cascade effect, sort of like a, a string of dominoes. And what happens is the bones of the lower extremities, particularly, specifically the lower legs, the tibia and fibula, these are the bones of the lower legs. These are carrying the most weight in the body. And you can see, especially in this poor little girl, you can see this huge amount of bowing going on. This girl will never be able to run. She'll never be cured of this. You can get the kids into a more healthy situation, hopefully before it gets to that extreme. The little boy is probably young enough. He may be able to recover somewhat. But they're always going to have joint issues, and they're probably always going to have difficulty in running and jogging and things like that. This was a pandemic at the time. Amongst children in the Industrial uh, Revolution, we see kids with rickets so common because they were working in factories, they were not getting the healthy sunlight that they're supposed to get. Furthermore, most of them were not eating very well either. This is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, also known as Iron City, USA, where they were smelting iron. This also brings up what was fueling the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was being fueled by coal. 
Is coal clean burning? Absolutely not. And by the way, there is no way to make coal clean burning. This is an image that I actually got from the funicular at the top of Mount Washington in Pittsburgh. Guess what time of day it is in Pittsburgh in the 1930s. This is not nighttime. This is noon, Pittsburgh, 1930s. Getting a lot of sunlight there? No. What is in the air? Well, smog which is partially fog and partially smoke. But the smoke from the smokestacks was actually so devastating in all of the industrialized countries. In fact, to this day, if you go to Pittsburgh and look at some of the older buildings, you'll see a blackening on the outside of all the buildings. Edinburgh is famous for it. Edinburgh and Scotland, blackening on the outside of all of these beautiful buildings. It looks cool. I mean, that's where they got the idea for Hogwarts, for God's sakes. It's cool looking. But can you imagine breathing that stuff? It's terrible for every aspect of health. This is Pittsburgh, United States, 1930s. Horrifying, right? So even if the kids aren't working in the factories, do you think they're getting a lot of direct sunlight? Absolutely not. Does rickets affect adults? It can, but not nearly as much. In fact, we call it something different. It's called osteomalacia in adults. Don't worry about it. I won't test you on it. But the, the thing is, osteomalacia means bone softening or softening of the bone. And what that is, it is usually associated with people who are under duress as far as a taxing on their body as far as their nutrients go and lack of sunlight. So where we see this the most is pregnant women. Pregnant women who are asked to stay in bed for up to a month before the pregnancy. This used to be uh, something that a lot of cultures around the world still do this, or even more than a month. They'll have a woman just stay in bed for as long as she can stand it, mostly to protect her and the, and the unborn child. But you can imagine they're not getting a lot of sunlight while they're doing that, are they? So what she tends to have after she gets out is her bones are a little softer. The difference is their bones aren't growing, so we don't see it to the near extreme that we saw in the children during this period of time. The last thing I want to bring up about this subject is what the United States ended up doing to ameliorate this, to make it better for children. One simple thing. If you remember uh, you probably grew up, you guys are younger, you probably grew up with school hot lunch program. Well, before that, the very first lunch program in the United States, it was still, you brought your bag lunch to school. But the one thing that they started providing to school kids, either at a fee or free, was the school milk program. And if you remember, if you look at a carton of milk, it is fortified with vitamins A and, importantly, D. And we all know that calcium is in milk. So they would fortify the milk by adding vitamin D for these kids to have. This actually began during the Industrial Revolution in the United States. Actually, well, during the height of the Ricketts uh, pandemic in the United States, they started this school, lunch, or school milk program which now has morphed into the school lunch program, and it's a wonderful thing, but it was in, invented originally to ameliorate this, uh, this problem with kids having rickets. So the big question is, can we tell ancestry from bones? By the way, notice I'm using the term ancestry, not race, not ethnicity, not nationality. Let me really quickly break down the difference between race, ethnicity, nationality, and ancestry. First of all, let's talk about race. Race, which is sort of a poorly looked upon word in the United States these days for good reason. It was used pretty poorly for a very long time and still is. Race is one of these ideas that the 
capacities of people in one way or another are limited by what ancestry they are from. But the biggest thing about race is there is no biological basis for race. Now, you probably said, well, wait a minute. You can see the difference between the different racial categories. Yes, you can. However, the only differences you can see are when those racial categories actually line up with ancestral categories. The term race itself is a cultural construct. That is, it's invented by our culture. For example, if you go to Louisiana, they will have these things called octoroon balls. I didn't know, when I moved down to New Orleans, I had no idea what an octoroon was. I thought it was a type of a cookie, like a macaroon, but it's not. Octoroon is what's considered somebody who is one-eighth, thus the octo, black. How in the hell, I said, can you, add, can you figure out who's one-eighth black? Well, truth is, you really can't. But there are a lot of associations with what an octoroon would be, or what these racial categories would be in Louisiana. If you go somewhere else and say, okay, what distinguishes somebody from somebody else on a racial basis? If you go to, say, Cuba and say, what's a black person? Cuban would look at you and go, uh, Cuban? I don't know. Because they don't make that same distinction let alone down to the eighth of somebody, which I think is insane. Of course, that distinction was made because they also associate a bunch of other things with being black. And the idea, of course, this racist idea, is stemming from uh, promiscu sexual promiscuity and all these other things that they associate with that, which is horrifying. So, Race, you can see, doesn't fall into the same category. It is looking at a continuum. If you look at the continuum of color in humans, which is basically all most race categories are based on, is coloration. Really, we're all just a, a, a form of beige. You can have people who are darker beige and lighter beige and somewhere in between, but fundamentally, we're all beige. So... Where do you draw the line from one step to the next? That is an arbitrary categorization. Arbitrary being that it is made up by people. And it is usually made up by people influenced by their culture. Therefore, racial categories based on color are fundamentally a cultural construct. We also have all these in-between terms like brown people. That is, people who are still not pure white, quote-unquote, which, by the way, nobody in the world is pure anything. And the idea that they are somehow different. That's where the biggest problem with most racist ideals comes from, is thinking people are different from any other thing. If you associate anything other than the SPF value of what somebody needs <laughs> to have a good day at the beach, with their skin tone, you're wrong. If you associate driving style, music taste, abilities to play uh, any sport, um, ability to run, ability to learn something, ability to see better, ability to hear better, ability to do anything other than put up with more ultraviolet light than somebody else, that is a racial. racial categorization. The other one, nationality. That's just based on whatever lines are drawn arbitrarily again. What's the difference between somebody from, I don't know, northern Michigan and southern Canada? Nothing. Nothing except for where those boundaries have been drawn. Actually, Michigan's a terrible idea because they it's separated by a big lake. So let's go up into northern Montana and southern Canada. The better. Completely arbitrary. And those lines can change. So nationality, 
eh, it's nothing more than a flag, really. So then we go into the last one, ethnicity. What is ethnicity? Well, ethnicity also does not have anything to do with ancestry. Let me give you some examples. The Probably the easiest example to give is something like Hispanic. The term Hispanic can literally mean anybody around the world. Can a Hispanic person be black? Yep, look at Cuba. Can an Hispanic person be Asian? Yes, Native Americans or people of Mayan or Incan descent are considered Asiatic. So an ethnicity is nothing more than a culture either borrowed or born in a given area. It has nothing to do with anything else. Same with Jewish. Does Jewish have a look? Not necessarily, no. There can be people of Jewish heritage that are black, people of Jewish heritage that are white, people of Jewish heritage that are virtually any color in the rainbow, whatever you want, because it's nothing more than a religion, and with it, a culture. Does that make sense? Okay, so we break it down to ancestry in anthropology. The only reliable element that we can tell ancestry from is the skull. Now, there are, you may ha even read this in some textbooks, people who believe that you can tell ancestry from postcranial bones, meaning the bones of the lower body. For example, uh, the arms or the legs, what you hear a lot is, if anybody is bringing a legit critique to this, is the human femur. Truth is, you can't tell that. That was based on the Terry Collection, which is a an old, old collection that was collected during the 1940s and 50s, and the problem with that is you have a very socioeconomic threshold between the two, a very distinct socioeconomic threshold between the two racial groups that they were separating there, being black and white, and the problem with that is you cannot actually tell ancestry. If you look Nowadays, you will not see those same bony traits that they were talking about. The skull, however, you can. Anthropologists only distinguish between three ancestral groups. Sub-Saharan African, those are not African American. It is people who live on the continent of Africa below the Sahara Desert. Very specific group. Indo-European, which actually includes those people in northern Africa, right along the Mediterranean, because there was a lot of shared ancestry around the Mediterranean for a very long time. Indo-European and Asiatic, which, as I mentioned before, is literally found all over the world, including Native Americans, Inca, Mayan, uh, people in Greenland, people in Alaska, people in Iceland people in, of course, Southeast, all the way up to Northeast Asia, all the way up into Siberia. Big group, did a lot of traveling early on. We'll talk a little bit about how these ancestries fall in and how we make sense of them. Okay, so why is there this distinction in the mid-facial organization between these skulls. Well, most specifically, we see this narrowing of the upper nose in Indo-Europeans from both the Asiatic and the Sub-Saharan African traits. Why is this? Well, this is a cold weather adaptation. It's probably a way of dealing with cold air. If you've ever gone out running when it's actually cold outside, you may have noticed that your lungs kind of hurt a little bit when you're breathing heavily and sucking in cold air. And I mean real cold air, not California cold air where it might drop down to 60. I'm talking about if you go out running when it's 30 degrees out or do something that's a lot of work, you may feel your lungs kind of burning. The reason that is, is because your lungs do not like cold, dry air. In fact, if you look inside each of these noses, you see these little coils, these little 
windy bits of bones sticking out, these protrusions inside the bone. What those are, those are actually frameworks for essentially a radiator in there. What the nose is trying to do is heat and humidify the air before it goes all the way down to your lungs. How does that work? Well, the lungs actually want the air as close to your body temperature and 100% humidity as it can get. So the nose has a lot of work to do. And to clarify, if you ever go out in the cold and your nose starts to run, that's why. It's your nasal, uh, basically those nasal tissues trying desperately to, to humidify that cold, dry air as quickly as it can. And what happens is sometimes in this profusion of liquid, then it starts to drain out. Okay, Harris lines. This is another way we can tell something about the individual. These only show up in x-rays, and you can see most of these pointed out by these small arrows on the x-rays. But do you see these horizontal lines going across the bone? Those are actually areas where the bone, the growth of the bone, the bone is more dense in those areas. Why is the bone dense? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Truth is, it's generally a bad thing because that means the bone did not grow as much during that period of time as it normally would have. The best analogy I have for this are tree rings. You guys have all seen tree rings before. When a tree is felled, you look at the stump of the tree, you can count the rings. And you usually associate those rings, each ring, with a year of the tree's life. And you'll see those rings aren't all the same width, are they? Some are skinny, some are wide. Well, the wide ones, hey, that was a good year for that tree. It was getting all the nutrients and water it needed. It grew a lot that year. Conversely, the really narrow rings, that wood is much denser. But it's because the tree did not grow very much that year. The same thing is going on with Harris Lock. As I mentioned, you can only see these in an x-ray. And they are actually dense tissue, dense bone tissue, because the bone did not grow much that year. What does that tell us? Well, that tells us that this person had a tough childhood. They were either dealing with a disease that was chronic and kept coming back. It was for a long period of time they had a disease, or starvation, or lack of nutrients for one reason or another. You can see most of these individuals, you guys can probably make out several lines in these x-rays. That means these people had a lot of bouts with whatever it was. As I mentioned, it could be a long-term disease or starvation from time to time or going without the proper nutrients from time to time, which, by the way, is slightly different than starvation. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Similar to Harris lines is this. Now these you don't need an x-ray to see. You guys can probably clearly see on both these sets of teeth, across the incisors and in some cases the canines, you can see these horizontal lines. These are virtually the exact same thing as the Harris lines. But these are called enamel hypoplasia. Hypo means not enough. Plasia means change growth or shape. So what we're seeing here is not enough growth. What does that mean? Same thing. When do teeth form? Teeth form virtually in utero and slightly thereafter. Teeth form, at least the crowns of the teeth, this enamel part of the tooth, forms very early in the, in the human's life. So what we're seeing again is a kind of um, record of this individual's history, particularly early on. And we can see they were either dealing with a disease, 
dealing with starvation or dealing with not enough of a specific nutrient during these times. And again, you can probably make out a lot of these lines lining up with each other. Each one of these is about with that same problem or a different problem, but one in which the growth was stunted in this individual. That means they didn't grow to their full potential, much like the tree ring. Okay, normally in my live class, I love to do these picture things. I love to have you guys look at these pictures and tell me what you see. Unfortunately, I can't get that feedback through a video. So I'm going to have to do this as best I can, <laughs> um, presuming what you would say. So even if I get it wrong, bear with me because other people are probably thinking that. So let's go with this. What are we looking at? Well, a couple of things will probably come to mind. Uh, this is a photograph taken by Franz Boas. Round about, well, I'm not going to tell you when or anything else about it. What I want you to do is think about what you see. You see a lot of people in a room, right? When was this photograph taken? I'm guessing that you already know it wasn't taken in the 1970s. This is an old photograph. It's from about the turn of the century, meaning the 1900s. Where was it taken? Well, I'll tell you this much. It was taken here in the United States. That should make you think of one of two places, be my guess. Which leads to a whole bunch of other things that we're going to discern from just looking at this stupid photograph. <laughs> First question, is this a family? If you look at it, you probably say, yeah, yeah, it's a family. Because a lot of the faces look the same. Look at the eyes, the eyebrows, the nose. Most, I don't know about that kid in the back, though. This kid back here, I think he just snuck in from down the hall. I don't know. But the rest of it, okay. So we've got a family here. Next, we start thinking about generations in a family. How many generations do you see? My guess is you see at least two generations. More than likely, you're seeing, okay, this guy in the back who doesn't look so pleased, that's probably dad. Then we've got two women here. One woman with a bright smile on her face, the other one, eh, a little less so. Which one's mom? My guess would probably, my guess that your guess, uh, guess is, is probably the woman in the middle with the big old smile on her face. And you'd be right. So we've got mom and dad, brood of children. That brings up who the hell is she? So we have at least two generations, right? Mom and dad and their kids. And then there's this other woman. Who's she? Most of you are probably starting to realize she looks a little older than the other woman. So she's probably grandma. Then we've got a bunch of kids. Okay. We'll get into talking about the rest of the generation. Some of you may be thinking, is there a fourth generation? We've got at least three. Grandma, parents, kids. We may have another generation, a fourth generation. Okay, let's go back to the overall picture before we get into that. Are these people rich? Chances are you're saying no, then you'd be right. This is taken in a tenement. 
That is, all of these people live in this one room. They do everything in there. Except they may have an outhouse, but otherwise, cooking, cleaning, sleeping, living, working, most of it's done in here. Okay. They're not rich. A lot of people. Lots of kids. I'm going to give you one more hint as to who these people are, which should probably break open the can of worms that is which cities they're in. My guess is once I tell you that these people are immigrants, is that you probably, immigrants from around the 1900s, tells you two things. Actually, several things. Probably, you're guessing that they're from one of two countries. Furthermore, you're probably, based on that, guessing that they're in one of two cities. Let me give you one more hint toward all of that. Look at how many children there are, which would tell us something else about these people. Clearly, they're European. They are probably, as far as a religion goes, you are probably thinking Catholic. You'd be right. It's a Catholic group. Catholic immigrants, turn of the century. This is probably driving you toward one of two countries. They both start with an I. You're probably thinking Ireland because of the Irish potato famine. There was a huge influx into the United States from Ireland. And the second one, Italian. Again, Ita Italy was a little bit different circumstance, but it was political upheaval that drove a lot of Italians to emigrate to the United States. Now, we have the two cities. I'm going to bet you Irish and Italian immigrants is going to narrow it down to one of two cities, or possibly both cities, for you guys. First city, Ellis Island, New York. New York City. Lots of tenements, lots, a huge amount of Italian and Irish immigrants came through there. The other city, also on the East Coast, probably thinking Boston. And again, you'd be right. There was such a massive influx of Irish into Boston during this period that there are actually literally more Irish, people of Irish descent living in Boston than there are, wait for it, in Ireland today. Isn't that insane? It's pretty incredible. The Irish potato famine absolutely decimated the country. Okay, so now we know this is a Catholic family from Ireland or England, I mean, I'm sorry, Ireland or Italy, that are living in either New York or Boston, and they are not rich. Okay. So what else is going on? If they don't have enough food to go around, who's going to get the majority of the food? Who's eating regularly? Now, allow me to anticipate your answer. Many of you are probably thinking, hey, the little kid, the little baby that's in grandma's arms, or the little child in the front, they're probably eating the, their share. Truth is, they're probably the last ones that are going to get food. Who gets the majority of the food and why? It's kind of astonishing to our 21st century ideals, but that would be dad. Why is dad getting the majority of the food? Because if dad's not healthy and in good shape and willing to go out there and work, nobody is going to get food. Dad has to eat. Furthermore, it's not like his work is, he's probably not working an IT job, is it? It's probably not a desk job, is it? No, in Boston and uh, New York, chances are he's working on the docks, doing hired, unskilled, heavy lifting labor. And he's probably a day worker. The younger boy directly in front of dad here, 
probably also able to work on the docks. The smaller children, the boys anyway, are probably working as newspaper boys or some other form of coal workers, grease monkeys, things like that. Now, turn your eyes to the women in the picture. By the way, all children, pretty much, Europeans, wore frocks when they were younger, so that doesn't mean that this, this little boy in the front, or I mean the little kid in the front, or the little kid up there probably are just wearing frocks, and it doesn't necessarily decide or delineate whether they're male or female. But the two women, adult women, in this picture, the mom, the grandma, they're dressed fairly well. You'll notice very little stains on their clothing, unlike the men and boys in the picture and little kids. They're probably working as domestic servants, which was one of the biggest outlets for immigrant women at the time. They could work either in the domestic sphere as a cook or a nursemaid or a, um, a maid or something along those lines. Now turn your eyes over to the younger two women in this picture, which is going to bring up the whole point of what we're talking about. Well, one of the big points of what we're talking about here. Do you see that little kid in, in grandma's arms? That little kid may actually be the child of the woman who's standing closest to the oven, to the stove. She's probably a full-grown woman. Furthermore, she's probably working as a domestic somewhere. Probably she's in her late teens, possibly early 20s. It's hard to tell. But that's not like a, a gag coffee pot beside her. She's really short. In fact, most people in this picture are really short. Who's the tallest person in the picture? Good old dad. Why would dad, mom, and grandma be tall and the kids not. Well, this is another preconception that we often have. Is that people from the past, well, even our past, you're probably either the tallest or among the tallest in your family. You're probably taller than your parents. But that wasn't always the case necessarily. Remember, these kids probably aren't getting three square meals a day. They may not even be getting one meal a day. In which case, are these kids likely to have enamel hypoplasias and, and Harris lines in their bones? Yes. Are they likely to grow to their full potential? Probably not. Which means that woman standing beside the stove could be, that's her full height. And she might be the mother of that little baby in grandma's arms. Maybe. But if so, we're looking at four generations. And the next generation in this family is going to be shorter than the generation that came from the old country. Because they're living a rougher childhood. As an immigrant family, very, very poor, here. Dad, grandma, and mom probably grew up fairly well off, or at least able to get three square meals a day, and then it became too rough, and they brought the kids over here. So these kids have probably never known the life that mom, dad, and grandma had early on. Therefore, those kids will never grow to their full potential. Their stature is going to be smaller than their parents. We'll talk a lot more about this next time.